You're tuned to The Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis. And today we're discussing the current tension between Japan and China. Japanese and Chinese diplomats met on Wednesday for urgent talks over a group of disputed islands in the East China Sea. Those negotiations on the fringes of the UN General Assembly meeting seem to have had little success. At the heart of the dispute are five small, largely barren islands called Senkaku in Japan and Diaoyu in China. The latest row over them began this month when the Japanese government said it would buy three of them from a businessman. That move triggered angry protests in cities across China, forcing Japanese businesses there to close and a warning from China that economic ties could be affected. So does this tussle over the islands illustrate relations between Asia's two biggest economies are at a particularly low ebb, or is this a minor blip in their often stormy relationship? Joining me to discuss this is Professor James Woodhausen of De Montfort University here in the UK, Dr Ramon Pacheco Pardo of King's College London, and on the line from Hong Kong we have Andrew Lung, an independent expert on China. While from Moscow's Russian People's Friendship University, we have Professor Yuri Tavrovsky. So can I just start with you, Professor Woodhausen? We've had previous spats over these islands. Is this one particularly significant? I think it is pretty significant, really. It's the 40th uh, anniversary of the Sino-Japanese cooperation agreements put together in 72. And uh, it coincides, of course, with President Obama's pivot to Asia. And I think the American leitmotif behind all of this dispute is that um, America is bound by its uh, treaty with Japan to defend Japan's ownership and protection of the Senkaku Islands. And uh, America has been making more aggressive noises, uh, opposing China's rise in uh, Asia and in the seas of uh, East China and South China. And I think, therefore, uh, it's not just the immediate contenders, Taiwan, uh, China and Japan around the Senkaku or the other contenders for other islands. It's also uh, a dispute involving America in decline and China on the ascent. Dr. Pardo, do you agree with that? It's, it's very much a one involving America as well as China and Japan. I think the U.S. somehow uh, has to be involved because of its relationship with, with Japan, so I, I do agree on, on that point. I do not necessarily agree with the point being made of this being a very significant uh, dispute in the sense that these disputes have been ongoing in the, well, in the South China Sea and in the East, uh, East China Sea uh, for a long time. It is significant, it is true that this is the 40th anniversary of the treaty between, between both countries, it's a very uh, significant date, but uh, on the other hand I think that uh, the dispute probably will be solved uh, in the not so distant future, and then we will see more disputes in the future, but I don't think that relations between both countries will be significantly affected. Uh, especially after we have the change in, o, o, of government in China, uh, we will see, I think, how things start to turn to normal uh, between both countries. Andrew Long in Hong Kong, how does it feel when you're in China and you're seeing this dispute, some people say, being whipped up? Does it feel like it's uh, top-down or bottom-up? Well, it's definitely um, bottom-up at first, but then, of course, uh, it has been um, managed uh, from the top. Uh, but what is where we're seeing now uh, is an almost explosion of nationalism um, uh, dating back to um, the recent history. Uh, don't forget China was invaded uh, by Japan um, and the, uh, some of the old atrocities memories is uh, still fresh and now re some of the old wounds are being uh, reopened in China. Added to this, of course, is uh, Japan's uh, perceived failure to admit to its past guilt. I mean, there are certain denials of, of past uh, atrocities, uh, not only to China, but for to Korea as well. Now, uh, as uh, my colleagues were saying, I mean, this dispute um, had been with us for a long, long time, so what's so special now? Uh, but what is special now is that Japan has been um, extremely assertive in exerting its claims. Uh, and this, of course, um, uh, puts China in a very, very difficult position. Uh, there is no way that the uh, Chinese leadership, um, at least of all the, uh, the, the new leadership, could be seen to be weak um, in face of um, uh, Japan uh, as a past aggressor. Um, and as China's economy is now the, big, the, the second largest in the world and the national pride uh, in China being um, a powerful nation now, 
um, uh, would, would prevent any kind of um, uh, 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 appearance of weakness. So I think that this is um, significant. Uh, and this um, uh, kind of uh, conference of forces, of dynamics, uh, is what makes this uh, current dispute uh, unique. Professor Tavrovsky in, in Moscow, yes. is there a danger perhaps of escalation, as, as we've just heard from Andrew Lung, of perhaps a military confrontation? Well, I don't think that uh, there'll be a real big-scale military confrontation, let's say war. Uh, I think that uh, both sides are not interested in a war. They are not prepared for a war. Maybe in a few years it will happen, but not now. And, you know, uh, a few days ago when the uh, Chinese flotilla consisting of almost 1,000 uh, fishing ships was moving towards uh, the Diaoyu Dao or Senkaku, uh, and there were some uh, Chinese patrol boats and uh, six big uh, Japanese patrol boats were in uh, the Senkaku vicinity. Well, uh, the world was expecting something to happen, but then sort of miracle happened, and uh, there was no confrontation, and nobody knows uh, about uh, that flotilla. Uh, fortunately, uh, United States uh, Defense uh, Secretary Leon Panetta uh, visited first uh, Tokyo and then uh, then Beijing, and so maybe uh, it was taken as a pretext for both sides to stop the hostilities. And uh, uh, well, uh, right now, uh, um, uh, uh, this morning I was reading an article in a very important Chinese newspaper called. Um, called Global Times. It's published uh, in English, but it belongs to the uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party. And the, the title is Risk of Armed Asian Conflict on the Rise, but Trade Links Rule Out War. And they uh, several times underline uh, that uh, uh, there, there, will be, uh, there won't be any war. Uh, one certain thing is that a war is unlikely in uh, the Asia-Pacific. Sorry, Dr. Woodhouse, you're trying to come in here, I think. Well, uh, I quite agree that, you know, the danger of an immediate war shouldn't be exaggerated. But I don't agree with Ramon, my friend here, that the dispute will be resolved anytime soon. I think it could go to the back burner, but I don't know that it's going to be resolved because behind it is not oil resources or even nationalism, certainly on the scale of the pre-war era in Japan and China. There's a bit of nationalism, but the protests in China don't compare with the strikes against the regime in China, which are much more violent and many more people involved. There are more, uh, you know, mobile phones taking pictures of a Japanese car being hit in the tyres uh, than there are real explosions of mass anger. I think that's been overdone by the press, although I'd be very interested to hear what Andrew Lung says about that and the scale, the real scale as opposed to the reported scale of the protest. But I think um, the although an immediate war isn't likely... Uh, there is a lot of history on both sides and therefore, you know, the fact that a flotilla doesn't get uh, embroiled in a, in a really violent action doesn't mean uh, that that couldn't happen tomorrow and that that couldn't lead to uh, a dramatic raising of tensions in the, in the whole area. I'm a, a surprised to hear from, from one of your interviewees that neither China nor Japan are prepared for a war. I think if you went to their armed forces, they'd tell you they were very prepared. Um, and I'm also surprised to hear the old canard that because they trade a great deal between each other, um, China and Japan will not go to war. The illusions that surrounded uh, the First World War between Britain and Germany, when there were enormous trade and investment links in that period, uh, many people thought it was impossible they could go to war for economic reasons, but war is not a rational enterprise, uh, gentlemen. It's, it's something that can be triggered by passions, uh, by incidents, and by a spiral going out of control. So I don't think trade is in any way a guarantee that the whole place will calm down. I, I do not agree with the point being made of uh, a war being a possibility uh, in the region. I mean, we have seen tensions, for example, within both Koreas and they have been escalated, no? and this could have actually triggered a, a, a real war between, between both countries. And I think the situation is similar in, 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 in between China, Japan, and even including Korea, Taiwan. Uh, w what I think is that military confrontation in East Asia it is highly unlikely, 
not only because of trade links, but also because we have many, for example, uh, foreign minister meetings that take place uh, at least once a year. We have many uh, many meetings between the militaries of the different countries. So we see an increase in contacts that go beyond trade that make this unlikely. So I'm not saying the situation is uh, as calm as it might be, might be within the European Union, for example, but we do see all, the, all these links, including uh, the plus three countries, as in plus three uh, countries in Northeast Asia by themselves, that I think make uh, war quite unlikely. And I think, if anything, the probability of war has been decreasing since the 1980s, basically since the end of the Cold War. <laughs> You're tuned to The Voice of Russia, I'm Howell Davis, and today we're discussing the tension between China and Japan. I'm joined by Professor James Woodhausen of De Montfort University here in the UK, Dr Ramon Pacheco Pardo of King's College London, and on the line from Hong Kong we have Andrew Leung, an independent expert on China, and from Moscow's Russian People's Friendship University we have Professor Yuri Tavrovsky. Andrew Lung, to go back to the, the question that was posed, when we saw these pictures of protesters in China, were there more people taking pictures on their mobile phones that were actually protesting? Definitely there are people always taking pictures on mobile phones now. The mobile phone population in China is the largest in the world. But um, no, nowhere in recent uh, history have we seen such a wide scale of protests across different cities in China, over 100 cities you know, all over the nation. Um, uh, yes, uh, there, there, was, uh, some, uh, there was some official participation uh, and even connivance, uh, but I don't think it's all whipped up to, um, you know, sort of by the Beijing. It, it, this, as I was saying, an uh, unleashing um, sort of pent-up uh, nationalism, especially against Japan because of history. Now, going back to war, um, uh, uh, my colleague is quite right. I mean, they're, they're, they're both countries are prepared for war, but I would also ag uh, agree with uh, my colleagues that um, no other no uh, neither of them wants a war but I think that the tragedy uh, sometimes is that uh, it's, a, it's a strategy tragedy of unintended consequences uh, because things can get out of hand very quickly and Professor Tavrovsky, we have the Chinese this week launching their first aircraft carrier. Do you see any significance in this as a way of saying to, China, saying to Japan and America look we're capable of, of moving ahead militarily well, I think this is uh, purely coincidence, uh, but uh, of course China is uh, beating up its navy. Uh, you know, 90% of Chinese uh, experts uh, go by sea, so, uh, and there, are, uh, uh, there is uh, an opportunity, the possibility that, uh, say, America, uh, because it uh, tries to contain China, will somehow try uh, to, to squeeze uh, the Malacca Strait uh, or other shipping lines. So China is uh, trying to beef up its navy. And uh, but uh, as my colleague from uh, Hong Kong uh, stressed, uh, China is now much weaker than America. But um, you know, uh, speaking of uh, America, America apparently is not interested in uh, full-scale war in Asia Pacific. What it is interested in is a uh, low-intensity conflict and operations, uh, and uh, if a war starts between Japan and China, then America will have to uh, to take a crucial decision. Uh, according to the uh, Japan-America Security Treaty, it has to to help, and uh, uh, Foreign Secretary Clinton several times reiterated that uh, America will help. On the other hand, uh, uh, Defense Secretary Panetta uh, stressed both in uh, Tokyo and in Beijing that America doesn't want to take sides in this conflict. And uh, another very bad uh, uh, consequence for America is that uh, there are many uh, influential politicians in Japan now uh, demanding uh, Japanese nuclear arms to confront Korea and China. So uh, I don't think America uh, is interested and it will allow the Japanese uh, to go to war. As for the Chinese, I think that uh, Chinese Communist Party controls its armed forces and it won't uh, allow any you know, accidental uh, use of uh, arms. So I'm still uh, insisting that uh, neither side is uh, prepared or uh, inclined for a real war. 
Uh, Professor Woodhausen, are we in, in danger of talking this up too much? I mean, both these countries, China and Japan, do have leadership elections or leadership changes coming up. Is this perhaps not just sabre rattling um, by some people within the various governments to try and make sure that to make them look good, basically, ahead of the leadership changes? Well, I don't think uh, even Andrew Liang in Hong Kong and certainly us Europeans and um, Tavarovsky in, in, in Russia are really talking anything up. We're, we're not the guilty parties for the tensions that are uh, happening there. And, you know, alarmism really isn't, isn't going to help anybody. I'm sure there's a lot of common ground here. Um, but, but we have seen spats like this over territorial disputes. I mean, there was one over these same islands in 2010, and that just went up and back down again. Yes, uh, well, you know, I can agree with Ramon uh, that there has been a warming of Sino-Japanese relations really since around 2008, not least about cooperation in gas in the South China Sea. And uh, there are also, as he rightly points out, more diplomatic meetings, there's, you know, there's more attempts at cooperation. But we also know, don't we, from history, uh, that just as things can spiral out of control on the ocean, they can in diplomatic negotiations. You know, if you don't meet the right person at the right time, you say that your diary is too full and so on. You know, offence can be taken, uh, face can be lost, which is uh, nothing to exaggerate by us Europeans, but I think is a little bit of a factor. In, in Asia, not losing face. And the weakness of both China and Japan's governments at the moment, um, with all the shenanigans around Xi Jinping going lost for 10 days, and now uh, Yoshihiko Noda, you know, having just 20% support in the polls, we don't, sh we shouldn't force it into a sort of Western narrative that, you know, they all want to wag the wag the dog with nationalism and all of these things and to distract attention. It's not quite so simple. But I don't believe that the popular passions in China about uh, Japan's very regrettable, Japanese imperialism's very regrettable intervention in China, I don't think the younger generation in China feels all the things that we could so easily ascribe to them. You know, it's a long time. It's not recent history. They've lost uncles and grandfathers to this, but many of them know, and I've talked to them, that young Japanese are no more responsible for what happened in the rape of Nanjing than are young Germans today responsible uh, for the Holocaust. I think what is dangerous about the situation, why... You oh, but, the, but there is a fundamental difference, having lived in China myself, mm. is that you talk to young Chinese people about the Japanese occupation, they'll get very upset about it in a way that wouldn't happen with the European children to talk about the Second World War, I think. It still is a live issue, the Japanese occupation, in a way that it isn't in Europe. No? Well, it's bigger, but if you talk to Jews or Israelis about the Holocaust, you'll find similar emotions, and I don't want to take anything away from that. What I'm saying is that, we, you know, the simple Western narratives of uh, it's all nationalism uh, and all of that, or it's all resources, or even, and there's much more grounds for this, that it's trade routes and so on. They're all very well, but I think the striking thing and what is new about the situation is the arbitrariness of international relations. Let's not forget that, uh, you know, Japan and Korea are in dispute on the Dokdo Islands, as the Koreans call it, and yet Japan and South Korea are both allies of America. Let's not forget that Obama couldn't really decide whether to intervene in Libya or in Syria uh, and in these kinds of places and a lot of the time you're fighting wars nowadays, for example the British in Afghanistan, for reasons that change by the week or maybe no reasons at all. So in this respect the you know simple slights on the ocean waves or in the diplomatic conference room and desires to move ahead in the opinion polls or to be re-elected or these sorts of things, there's an arbitrariness to international relations today which is not to do with resources and trade routes and so on, but it's to do with what kind of, what side of bed you got out in the morning. And that is very dangerous. Things can go out of control there. A full-scale war, no, it's going to be prefaced, if there is one, it'll preface, be prefaced by a long period of tension and alliances and uh, diplomacy and some warming of relations, some cooling of relations. That's not what we're saying. Is the overall situation very intractable because of the course of the 20th century? Does it, 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 have things calmed down in the past and therefore they will definitely calm down in the future. No, it is a bit intractable, becoming more intractable. And uh, things are not guaranteed to calm down. No war tomorrow, but it's not going to guarantee to calm down. You're tuned to The Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis. And today we're discussing the tension between China and Japan. I'm joined by Professor James Woodhausen of De Montfort University here in the UK. 
Dr. Ramon Pacheco Pardo of King's College London. And on the line from Hong Kong, we have Andrew Leung, an independent expert on China. And from Moscow's Russian People's Friendship University, we have Professor Yuri Tavrovsky. Dr. Pardo, do you see it as becoming more intractable or less? I, I think it, there, is, there has been a failure in dealing with these issues properly, uh, the East China Sea and the South China Sea. So, so, so in a sense, it is true that it is becoming more intractable insofar the longer this goes on, obviously, true. the more and more uh, each country is going to defend its own position. So we have seen attempts, for example, through the uh, ASEAN Defense uh, Ministers Plus uh, to have more countries involved in dealing specifically with the South China Sea, and this hasn't really led to anything yet. So in a sense, it is true that if countries in the region, uh, and I include the U.S. here because of the military presence in the region, if they are not able to solve these issues uh, soon or, let's say, over the next five, ten years, then the positions are not going to change from either country. And I think uh, even Andrew mentioned before, uh, within Japan we see an increase in assertiveness, which uh, is a very important change uh, in East Asia. This is something that wasn't there before. And uh, the more assertive uh, generation of politicians in Japan are less willing to compromise and are definitely less willing to uh, give way to the demands of, of, of other countries. In South Korea, we see something similar. North Korea is not the main issue in South Korea anymore. You talk to, to South Korean people, I just came back from, from there, uh, talking to people in government, they are more concerned with, uh, for example, territorial disputes uh, with Japan, for example, uh, possible trade being diverted towards China. So what we do see here is that unless there is a, a proper meeting in which uh, leaders come together and say, okay, we're going to solve these issues one by one, and this is unlikely, I think, in the short term, unless we have this type of meeting, yes, the problems are going to become in intractable, and we will see tensions. Uh, I don't think we'll see any sort of war, but I think there will be tensions that will be, well, they will be stronger, they will be lighter according to the circumstances. Uh, Professor Tavrovsky in, in Moscow, are we seeing on both sides, China and Japan, more assertiveness? And we were just talking now about Japan being a more ge generation of more assertive politicians. But of course, is that also happening in China? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, I, I was in Beijing uh, a few months ago and I visited a Museum of National uh, Anti-Japanese War uh, on the famous Marco Polo Bridge. And you know, I was uh, I was very surprised. There are thousands of uh, young Chinese uh, moving around the this big museum, uh, uh, making pictures uh, with their telephones. And uh, you know, the mood was. I spoke to them, and uh, they are very, very much anti-Japanese. And uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, this is actually uh, uh, part of the biggest, uh, bigger problem because Japan has territorial problems with all the three neighbors: China, Korea, and Russia. And uh, compare it with the, um, another uh, country, which was the uh, initiator of the Second World War, Germany. You know, uh, I, I don't think there are anti-Germany feelings now in Europe. Uh, in Russia, they are almost inexistent, and uh, Germany doesn't have any territorial uh, claims uh, to Poland, to Russia, or uh, France, uh, any country. And uh, can you imagine a monument to a 35 million killed Chinese in the center of uh, Tokyo? While well, in Berlin, there is a monument to 6 uh, million European Jews killed there. And G German Chancellor knelt in uh, one of the extermination camps in Poland. Can you imagine a Japanese prime minister uh, praying to the memories of uh, those Chinese and uh, Southeast Asians killed by the imperial army? So I think uh, the problem is that the Japanese uh, didn't repent. And so uh, this uh, hatred, in not only in uh, Korea and uh, in uh, China, uh, it, it won't subside. And it will uh, uh, it will give uh, birth to more and more uh, problems for, for Japan. OK, Andrew Lung, we have uh, economy in Japan doing very badly, but you also have a Chinese economy that's not doing as well as it has been recently. Is there a danger that even this doesn't go to a full-scale war, there might be economic repercussions of the two largest economies in Asia having trouble? 
Well, definitely. I mean, if there is a conflict, I mean, even if a temporary conflict uh, would send both economies uh, further down. Um, but I don't think that the, um, um, uh, 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 you know, there is no doubt that there will be an impact on the economy. But I think the most important thing is that um, uh, this degree of, uh, 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 of, of um, an unpredictable and predictability, um, you know, my colleague referred to this as arbitrariness, uh, or I, I would refer it as a, a certain pity, in other words, um, unintended consequences. Uh, and these unintended consequences are all resting uh, upon all these historical factors. Uh, the fact that, um, as my colleague was saying, uh, of Japan not really attuning in full for this uh, past, uh, for this wartime past, um, and um, Japan being more assertive, and of course China's nationalism being on the rise because of China's economy and so on and so forth. So all these uh, factors are coming into play. But I think the uh, one recent um, 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 uh, uh, the turn of events is the um, um, resort to the United Nations. Um, for, for example, the Japanese uh, Prime Minister is going to make a statement in the United Nations, and of course the, the Chinese Foreign Minister is perfectly prepared for that, and taking this opportunity to lay um, um, uh, 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 a plain uh, Chinese historical claims, which China has never in the past been able to do. So I think that that would be a, a, a useful forum, and hopefully this would calm down um, um, uh, emotions a little bit. Um, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility of um, you know, even minor crashes, you know, getting out of hand. Um, but the, uh, the other un- unknown factor, of course, is the position of America. Now, of course, America can stay out of, of even minor crashes, but in, in case of a major escalation, uh, there's, no, there's no way that America could stay out, and this could um, uh, provide a, a further, you know, pouring further oil um, uh, to the fire. But then the, uh, uh, the, the irony is that n- none of these parties really want a war, um, these of all China and, 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 and of course not the, the Japan and, and not the United States. But sometimes if things get out of control, it would be very, very difficult for, for um, uh, any of these countries uh, to, manage, uh, to manage the situation. Okay, we're almost out of time. Just one last one, Professor Woodhausen. Well, uh, I think it's a little glib, if I may, to say that, you know, Japan has not repented for the war in the way that Germany does. I mean, I was very careful in my earlier remarks to talk about Japanese imperialism. I think if you're talking about an idiot like Yoshihiko Noda and uh, or Koizumi's visit to the Yasuveni shrine and, you know, sort of well, jumping you might on call the... Well, an idiot, but they're both prime ministers or have been prime ministers. Yeah, yeah but they yeah. enjoy very little domestic support and they, their willingness to accommodate the... the uh, spent embers of Japanese nationalism is uh, very spineless. But that doesn't mean that the Japanese population suffers uh, genuine collective guilt uh, or won't atone for its past misdeeds. The majority of the Japanese population is pacifist in, in outlook and certainly doesn't want a war with China and doesn't have much in common with uh, Ishihara and all the nationalists in Japan. So I think we do have to distinguish between the regime which is faltering and the sentiments of the people. I think the same is relevant in Korea and, uh, and China. Well, that's all we have time for. May I just thank my guests, Professor James Woodhausen of De Montfort University, Dr. Ramon Pacheco Pardo of King's College London, and from Hong Kong, Andrew Leung, independent expert on China, and from the Russian People's Friendship University, Professor Yuri Tavrovsky. Thank you all very much.